possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Well, it's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the Out EGA podcast. How are we all doing? Mikey Stafford here. Um, to preview the first weekend of the Allianz Hurling League, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Jackie Tyrrell, Rory O'Neill and Connor Neville. How are you doing, lads? Good, hey, Mikey. Hey, Mikey. In the second half of the show, we'll have Colm O'Rourke coming up to discuss uh, the second weekend of the Allianz Football League. It'd be nice to have a, uh, a Mead legend on to discuss what's going on in the Royal County. And he might also like to talk about Dublin a little bit, you never know. Uh, okay, but first things first, hurling matters. Um, Jackie, it was, it was sad enough news yesterday to hear Porg Maher's retirement. He was he did an interview with our, with RT and a few other media organizations about 10 days ago and he was raring to go. He said he had a couple of little niggles, but he should be, re- he should be back in the middle of the league, I think. And now he's been told he not only inter-county, but club hurling, he's having to retire from all at the age of 33. Yeah, Mikey, it's, it's actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually very sad for Paddy and uh, the fact that the real decision, um, it's just a consequence of obviously the neck injury that's obviously must have only came to light the last week or so. Cause yeah, I, I picked up on some of those interviews and commentary and you could feel the enthusiasm literally coming from the quotes of him that he was looking forward to this year he's obviously in impeccable shape he was looking forward to the new management coming in and then for that all to be taken away from him um it's it's actually quite sad and I suppose f- from me a guy that has retired you know we're very lucky in the GA that you have your club to go back to you can play senior you can go down the ranks and you can stay involved and stay playing at a level and you know other sports that's not the case. You look at rugby and things like that. When they go out, they go out at the top and that's it. But that's one of the comforts of, of the GA world. And unfortunately for Paddy, that has been taken away from him. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's going to be a big void of his life. He's known nothing else for the last, I don't know, X years. But he, what a serve, a warrior, what a player for Tipperary. You know, his consistent performance from Tipperary when he first came in in 2009. I remember that league final when he was the first time I ever said, God, who is this lad in the yellow hat at the back mark Henry Shefflin? I said, but from then on, I can. I was only thinking, man, I can only remember one kind of subpar performance and that was against uh, Cork in, in Parky Cueve in 2010. He was full Zaki. Zaki. Zaki gave him a, a mm-hmm. hard time, but, you know, he bounced back, he went back into the half back line and he was utter dominant um, no matter who he marked, he never really had any trouble or any really bad days after that. And that is just testament to the consistent level of performances, whether it was league, whether it was club with Turtle Sarsfield. He was always hugely, hugely influential figure. And I remember in 2011, when we played Tipperary, we actually targeted him from the point of view of, lads, we have to limit this guy's influence from his distribution point of view. Because there are certain players in certain counties that when they do something, whether it be a catch, a hook, a block or a score, it lifts the crowd. Tommy Welch was our one. Um, I remember for Tipperary, John Carroll used to be one for years, and Potty Mar was that. When he caught a ball, I remember in 2016, he caught a ball over Walter Welch, put it over the bar. It was a dagger in our hearts. I remember uh, in 2019, he caught a puck out again off, off Walter, Walter Welch, and they got a goal off him. And there was just these huge pivotal moments. And when he done something, it, it, it evoked an emotion in the tip crowd that was just... It was massive. It were always almost like uh, turning points in games. Yeah, uh, Connor. He he is like he, Jackie's spelled it out there. His his high fielding was impeccable. He scoring from distance, but he's one of these players for all his skill. And it was without doubt he was a very skillful hurler. Uh, it's his bravery and his physicality that stands out, which almost makes him something of a throwback almost to this day and age. Like you think of the, the block on Shane Bennett. He had no hurl, so he blocked him with his two hands, or obviously the famous shoulder. On um on <laughs> Joe Canning, Joe which Canning. is hilariously Jake Morris's favorite Potty Maher memory because he had a yeah. front row seat for it. He just that is brilliant that he'd admit, oh yeah, no, him breaking Joe Canning in half is my favorite Potty Maher memory. But he <laughs> is something of a throwback, isn't he? You can see historically. I wonder will he re- be recalled as a kind of an inheritor of the Tip sort of sixties defense? You know, will he will he be seen as a sort of modern update of that? Um, when he came onto the scene, he was very much sort of. I always thought emblematic of that what Tip decided they needed to do to beat Kilkenny. They needed to kind of physically match them and outmatch them, which was the only game in town, it seemed, around 20, 2009, 2010. <laughs> and sort of Potty Mar was kind of that. He was sort of the, the, the main 
the main colossus in trying to do that. And, uh, you know, he, I just saw someone pointed out the irony of him, actually, uh, the sad irony of him having to retire through injury, given that he was hardly ever injured throughout mm. his career, you know? I mean, yeah. I don't think, it, I can't recall him missing a game. He always seemed to be a pivotal figure in that back line, whether it was at half back initially, then sometimes when they were stuck, as they sometimes were at full back, he would kind of slot in there. And, uh, you know, he was always such a, a visible, vibrant, important presence in that team. And um, as, as Jackie said, I mean, it's I suppose the saddest thing is that he can't even step down to play club as players often do now. He's had to retire from contact sports. Yeah, it is. Sad. I, was, I just wondered, Jackie, quickly, did you ever take a shoulder from him yourself? Obviously, you were safe at the other end of the field most of the time. No, no. Back then, I didn't go too far forward and, and <laughs> opposed the defender didn't come, come too far yeah. Yeah, but people pay good money that could be like a, a, the, the gale games form of like white collar boxing you and Paddy could if he wasn't if he could take contact you could just get into a ring and shoulder each other for half an hour I think people pay to see that uh, I don't think they will I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm half the man I was back then so uh, no, I, I think I'll be up for that uh, maybe in your prime I should have thought of it at the time I could be a, I could be a, a promoting millionaire by now one um, other thing the one that just one that one thing on it though Mike I would say is the void he will leave um, he's leaving Tipperary at a time where there's a bit of flux on the panel there's new management his leadership abilities as Connor said he was never injured you know they have um, have they already made replacement I would suggest no and I think uh, he'll be really difficult boots to fill mm-hmm. as Col- like Owen Ryan of the online desk he uh, interviewed Colin Bonner yesterday and he, he said he noted how Colin Bonner even when asked straight out is an all Ireland a name for tip this year he wouldn't nail his colours mass he wouldn't say it was you know like he's, he's probably last year obviously they had a very good chance to beat Limerick <laughs> at half time you would have put a lot of money on them um, but it kind of fell away and their season kind of dissipated after that and now with the retirements they've had it is hard to, to look at them as the contenders that they were for the last decade and a half. Well, if, you, if you look at Mikey, their full-back and centre-back from last year is gone, so the mm. heart of their defence and a world of experience has just walked mm. the door. So that's hard to replace mm. literally overnight. What it does do, though, and I think it's very interesting and exciting from Tipperary, where we were always asking the question, when are we going to see these young lads, this under-20 team now, no choice now. to see him? They, like they're, Colin Bonner almost forced into a corner probably to look at Paddy Cadell seriously, uh, to look at Robbie Byrne. I have a kind of a left of centre one that I think Noel McGrath would be an outstanding centre back for Tipperary. I always mm. had that idea that he could be just unbelievable there with maybe a defensive minded midfielder in front from maybe a, a Dan McCormack. He could be an outstanding centre back, but you know, they also need a full back as well to replace Paddy Marina. Mm. Um, I think the time has come now for these temporary uh, young guns to see are they up, up to it. Yeah, so look, that, that that's one storyline ahead of the start of the league. But I have, to, I have to say the hurling league doesn't seem to be, people aren't salivating over the way they were the, the start of the football league. Um, and it's it's fair to say, Connor, that the, the league has been somewhat diluted and diminished since 2020 when they went back to the division one kind of mixing the teams rather than division one a and division one b being ranked one to six and seven to twelve they've gone the route of kind of mixing and matching yeah and i think it has to be remembered that limerick in 2019 uh sorry 2018 they they finally got out of division one b it was becoming this albatross around their neck that they were stuck in division one b when everybody else was getting out of it wexford clambered over them galway clambered everybody got out of it before them they got out of Division 1B, they won it, and then they won their All-Ireland, and now they're seen as the dominant well, force in hurling. There was a time, briefly, when 1B was the place to be, I think. Uh, Galway got relegated from 1A, which was regarded as very intense at the time, and I think that was why the sort of hurling managers seemed to lobby for change, because 1A was becoming far too intense, and it was sort of sapping them before championship. And if you recall, Galway got relegated in 2016, stayed down in 2017, um, they actually didn't escape 1B, despite winning the league because of the format. They got mm. through cup finishing second. I believe Wexford might have beat them in Salt Hill. It was the only game they ended up losing in 2017. That's right, yeah. So they stayed down there. It didn't do them any harm. The following year, 2018, we had Galway and Limerick in sort of the 1B promotion decider, effectively. And they ended up playing the All-Ireland later in the year. So there was a narrative at that time that 1A was becoming detrimental to the teams in it and 1B teams 
there was a joke among the Galway support that they were doing their best to stay in 1B. You know, <laughs> never, they, they never actually got out of it other than it changed, the format changed and they kind of mixed and matched the teams. So uh, in that sense, the managers asked for this. The league is kind of slightly diluted. I mean, obviously the, the separate thing is the change in the championship format, which has really robbed the sort of league of what USP it had. Mm -hmm. really. Yeah, that's true. When, when the championship is a league, what is the league in that context? And the yeah. championship is a sort of league now. Um, well, it's, it it's is, yeah. Football, it's... football crowd we're trying to get in. And, you know, in a sense, the league feels like a kind of just a, it's, it's been diluted to being a, a warm up tournament at this stage. Yeah. Let's let's get the cold hard opinion of the of the TV producer then Rory the the national the Alliance hurling league a little bit of a hard sell in terms of you know we're we're stumping for a football match this weekend on RTE for well for obvious reasons it's Dublin and Kerry but hurling would have been an option hurling during the summer is often seen as RTE's preferred choice but during the spring um the 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 hurling league doesn't quite have the cachet of the football league I think the league is just probably going back. And it's going back to where 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 it was and where it used to be, which is really a glorif a bunch of glorified challenge matches, warm warm up games where managers now are really getting an opportunity to try players because there's no major pressure. You're not going to be relegated, and everything is going to be focused towards the 16th of April. And like from a TV perspective, if you look at it, like we've eight live games over the course of this year's league six of them are football and two are hurling but come the 16th of april that will be completely turned on its head because the football championship won't catch fire for about three months whereas the hurling is going to be hammer and tongs every week from the get-go and some of the matches even in the first weekend alone are i mean it's like in both provinces so i think to my mind and look i'm i i think it's a good it, hurling is in a good place in terms of where it is. I think, what did we all want? We wanted more championship matches. We wanted the top teams playing against each other more often. We wanted more games, more, uh, and, and lo and behold, that's what the people want. The attendances are up, the crowd, the, the audience figures are up, the TV figures are up, you know, like uh, 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 the league, I suppose, kind of comes then with a small bit of, there's a small bit of, um, dispassion around it but i think that's okay mm -hmm. yeah jackie you um have six league medals uh quick quiz question do you know where they are uh yeah they're, my mom has them out in the home that's just a stock answer every ga player gives i think when he doesn't yeah, have a foggiest that. notion my mom has oh my mom looks after all my medals except the all <laughs> ireland ones which i keep myself or does she have them all no she looks after them all yeah she has them all Okay, uh, you won six anyway. Uh, congratulations to your mother on those. Um, <laughs> four of them, six, nine, twelve, fourteen. You went on and won all Ireland, so that's a good strike rate. Five and fourteen, you didn't. You won the league, but you didn't win the all Ireland. What what kind of stock did Brian Cody put in the league? Was it challenge matches? Was it tuning up, or was it a trophy that to win and Kilkenny like winning trophies? I think Brian's attitude was pretty clear. It was. It was. It was completely foot, foot to the floor and um, every game was hugely hugely competitive he didn't really look at it the league it was an opportunity to uh, to develop it was an opportunity to build a team and it was an opportunity you personally if you were playing you had a jersey and you wanted to hold on to it and I suppose he, he followed that through that if you performed in the league you played in the championship but look the nature of the championship has completely changed from then back then when the league was finished you went back to your club for a month then you were back into Kilkenny for maybe a couple of weeks. So it was a six-week kind of gap in between the league and the championship. And then you were playing every three weeks. Whereas now the league finishes and maybe two weeks later you're into a championship, which you're playing possibly four or five games over a six-week period. So the demands is all about the panel now. It was always about the panel, but the panel back then was kind of 15 playing with maybe three or four coming on. Now in the round robin situation, you need a panel of 20 plus. You have guys, you'll have guys that are seen as rookies this year that will probably be playing in your last game due to suspension and injuries, and you will probably be looking for a result. So the whole dynamic of the round robin has a huge influence on the actual league format. But within the league, I do think there's a couple of teams that will be earmarking a big performance. I do, I do think silverware for the likes of a Waterford, for the likes of a Dublin, I think it would do an awful lot versus silverware for 
a Kilkenny or even a Tipperary or a Limerick. I just think the journey that Lean Cal and Matty Kenny are on with those, they're three, four years down that. I think silverware would be a huge boost for them, their panel, the morale and the confidence of them. So I expect strong performances from them. Look, Limerick will, of course, be there, thereabouts. Kilkenny will always compete. Um, you know, Cork can be blasé about it, but um, the dynamic of the league has changed. It's all about unearthing talent, developing your panel, getting miles into kind of the older personnel of the panel without too much, but that they're ready for championship come in the round robin, that they're ready to hit the ground with their best team and probably five, six, seven subs backing them up that when they come in that they can contribute. Yeah. Uh, Connor, the, the teams that may not be too interested in winning the league, um, like I guess their great challenge is to try and try and figure out the, ch- figure out the mystery, figure out the conundrum that is Limerick because, you know, kind of they have, they've changed the game in the last couple of years with their, just just the just their size their strength the fact that they play to their strengths which are which is their physicality their, their overall overall skill level and you know there was you know they didn't manage to win it in 2019 if they had we'd be looking at a, a four in a row team and but no more than jackie's team they're not just winning these titles you know they're winning them convincingly and it's not that the, the not that this is a worry for the game it's always had dominant players but it's a worry for the teams that are being dominated. You're, you're asking me to come up with a plan to top a Limerick, are you? Well, I'm <laughs> guessing you have it. You have a you have back of a fag box there. You have it. You have it written down. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't have any blueprint. Um, yeah, I, Limerick obviously um, they should really be going for five in a row. Only they terrible start against Kilkenny in that 2019 All Ireland semi final. Um, that was still at a time when the Munster champions had a habit of flopping in the All-Ireland semi-final every year because of the gap or whatever. Um, that's That was taken away the last two years. Um, yeah, uh, it's very hard to see how they can be stopped. As you said, their physicality, uh, very hard to get around that. And then their use of the ball. I mean, they sort of have married sort of the perfect elements of what makes a sort mm. of winning hurling team. Uh, teams have got close. I mean, Tipperary obviously had them on the rack last year in the first half. That was... Um, any notion that they, that they might win it was unceremoniously, unceremoniously ended in the third quarter. Waterford have kind of given them hell. You know, they tore into them pretty aggressively in the semi-final last year. But even then, you know, sort of the game ran out. Um, you could argue Waterford are p- possibly looked the most primed to take them down, or at least the next best, because, you know, Cork were... were way out of their depth or it looked like in the All-Ireland final really I mean Galway in 2020 did draw level with them going into a going into a lengthy injury time period now that was a slightly odd game I mean Galway got a lightning start they played a highly defensive game in that match and they they had to rely on a sort of Limerick profligacy that day in terms of you know Mm -hmm. blowing goal chances and hitting uncharacteristic wides and they also had an absurd number of sideline cuts scored. I think it was five <laughs> in that game. Four from sure. Canning and one from Finton Burke as well, which is forgotten. But so Galway got close to them that day. There's a sense that they might have the physical attributes to match them on their day. I, I, I'm not sure whether Galway seem to be not quite in, they seem to be possibly entering some transition, maybe not quite as acutely as Tipperary, but there's a degree of transition happening there. But, yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in Galway, Roy. You know, because obviously Henry Shefflin has gone in there, and they got a bit of a, a flake from Dublin, which is yeah. there's no shame in that. Wexford got one from Dublin last weekend as well. <laughs> Dublin are a Walsh Cup team. I'm telling you, they're a powerhouse. But um, it, it, there's a lot of interest, Rory, in how Henry Shefflin gets on in Galway because there's no doubt in the raw materials there never has been in Galway. But as Connor says, there might be, you know, uh, uh, there might this might be a a, a season where out with the old, in with the new, mightn't mean they're quite the contenders people would think they should be. Which is why I thought it was, I suppose, a surprise that Henry would take the job on because it did look like a rebuild job in Galway. You were losing Joe Canning, you were losing possibly David Burke, or certainly he's coming to the end of his career. Johnny Cohen, a few others. Is Dahi Burke the force that he once was? Probably, but, you know, look, a lot of these guys have a lot of hurling, and in Dahi Burke's case, a lot of football done and a lot of football played. So I was surprised Henry took it on because generally speaking, a rebuild job is usually an inside man. 
it's usually somebody within the county who knows the scene. But look, I think if there, it, it, like, if there, if you, if if there's anybody that can, is going to get a twist out of that Galway dressing room, if someone of the stature of Henry Shefflin walks in through the door, you'd know you're going to get an immediate bounce. Just in relation to Limerick and how far ahead of the pack that they are, I would agree that they are ahead of the pack and, and, and by a good bit. But are they as far ahead of the pack as we'll say Jackie's team were, we'll say around 2008, 2009? I would argue no. I would, have, I would argue that there was probably a greater sense of foreboding about the prospects of trying to take Jackie's Kilkenny team down than there is with this Limerick team. And you know, you just don't know what could happen as well. Like you have to remember that was a different era. Obviously it was, there was no round robin. Limerick are going to like, I mean, in terms of what they're chasing now, they're going to have to go through the bear pit. That is Munster. Teams are going to be lining them up. You might pick up injuries to key players. You might pick up suspensions. You just don't know what could happen. One or two, let's say heaven forbid, because we know, but let's say something that were to happen to Key and Lynch for argument's sake, you know, all of a sudden the game changes. So do I see Limerick as being as insurmountable as maybe Jackie's Kilkenny were? I don't but I think it's going to take some team and some performance to take them down. Um, just a word before we finish, Jackie, on another of your former teammates who's obviously in inter- inter-county management, uh, Mick Fennelly. Awfully, you're back. They're not quite back into the Liam McCarthy, but they're back in the big time in terms of the league in Division 1. And we can all romanticise a bit and everything, but Hurling has its strongholds and they're not that. there's not that many of them. So to mm-hmm. see kind of Offaly go the way they did, um, rivalries aside, I think pe- most people, Wexford, Kilkenny, anywhere, are pretty happy to see them back up with a pretty young and exciting team. Yeah, I think anyone in the hurling world is delighted to see Offaly starting to come back. So they had a few tough years, and since Mike took over the helm there, it's been nothing but kind of positive. Uh, Shane Lowry getting involved. Uh, Michael Fenley starting to build a, a really good team there. They're back in Joe McDonough, and they'll be looking not just to, to, to compete this year after coming up in, in the Christie ring, They'll be probably looking to win that or go very close on it. And obviously, they'll be probably looking at the Westmead model as regards Westmead were in, in, in the top tier of the league. Probably took a lot of bad beatings, but learned a lot from it and brought that back to the Joe McDonough. And you see the success and how well they played in the final last year. Um, so that's that seems to be the way forward. And I'd imagine Mick will be looking to, you know, get that experience of playing week in, week out against the top teams. They're the Galways of this world, getting the learnings from it. Um, and being able to regroup and go really hard at the Joe Mac, Joe McDonough, but uh, yeah, he he has a he has a very youthful team there as well. Um, so look, I think anyone in the Harlem world welcomes Offaly coming back uh, and coming back strong. Yeah, they 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 start they start off uh, away to Galway, and I think then they're they're home to Clare. They got Wexford in their group as well. Um, could you? Along with Limerick, obviously, and Cork, could you see them staying up? That's to, when you when you read it out: Cork, Clare, Wexford, Limerick, Galway, and Offaly. It, it it's it's not an easy, not an easy endeavor to stay in that division. No, it, it's it's going to be a struggle for them. It really is. It it's they probably got the harder of the two sides of the league. Um, but I suppose if they if they do get relegated, uh, I don't think it'd be the worst in the world. You wouldn't know they could they could they could stay up and win a relegation final or that. Um, but look, he will be looking at the bigger picture of developing players, getting them used to playing at that top level and being able to survive those environments and obviously hope, hopefully not taking too bad of beatings uh, that, that damage morale or confidence and things like that so that they can, that they can go into Joe McDonough ready to go and that exposure to that a high level performance, that, that will stand well for him. Okay, in a word, lads, I'll ask you all to 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 name your to name your winner of the competition that we don't think the big teams are particularly interested in. Um, I am going to say Galway for the crack, Connor. Um, Waterford, Jackie, Limerick, Rory. Yeah, I'm going to go for Waterford as well. I think uh, I think they will. Um, I think they're. I, I I agree with Connor. I think they're probably team number two to Limerick. I think, and if Bally Gunner um, get over the line next week against Bally Hale, I think that'll give them another boost. And um, yeah, I, I think it's year three for Liam Cahill. COVID is gone. You know, uh, I like to cut a water for his jib. Alrighty, Jackie, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we'll let you go now and we'll be back in a couple of minutes with Colm O'Rourke to talk about football.
Welcome back. Uh, we've been joined by Colm O'Rourke to look ahead to week two of the Allianz Football League. How are you getting on, Colm? Doing great. Never better. Fighting fit. Waiting for the call, actually. But my phone doesn't ring to see would I be available for Sunday. I'm disappointed. Oh. It- I could do which in full forward. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we we just expect you're too busy on the radio talking about the leaving sir column. That's that's where that's all we hear you talk about these days. <laughs> well, at, at least that's sign seen that the You can, can you can forget about that for a couple of months. Begin the rest of our lives. Um, so the, the so the <laughs> the other stress in your life beyond beyond leaving Sir students and and that would would I would I expect at the moment be the Meads senior footballers. Um. I don't, I don't think we need to go back over the, the, the coals of Sunday too much. It was obviously a very, very bad day at the office in Salt Hill, 45 minutes before the first score. They're at least at home uh, in front of their faithful in Park Charlton now against Roscommon on Sunday. What what would you like to see and what do you think Mead supporters need to see? A result would be nice, obviously, but I think performance-wise, there's things that you'll all be looking to, looking to see improved on. Yeah, well, any self-respecting player or team will put in a massive effort after a big disappointment like uh, uh, Galway and all the stick that goes with it. So uh, I would expect a completely different type of performance. Now, the issue with Mead is Mead have been more or less a second division team, one up uh, to the first division and then straight back down. So uh, I think in the last seven or eight years, Mead have not beaten a team who are rated higher than them in the country in that period of time. So you know, the second division is sort of natural territory. But I was reminded by Liam Harlan yesterday, actually, from going back to our previous days, of a hammering we got in Kiltoom against Roscommon in, uh, I think it was 1990, and we won the Leinster and went to the All-Ireland final this year. And another hammering we got from Antrim up in Casement Park, and we went on and won the league afterwards. So... Uh, all teams have off days. Uh, it's what comes after it that's important. Yeah. Um, of course, did, did, 1991, didn't you start with the draw against Wicklow as well? That, Absolutely, yes. That, that, that epic length of, a, of, a, of a season. So things can that be was, turned around, and there's there, the one thing you could say this time uh, uh, with the with the... With the season the way it is now, there's no shortage of games and they're coming thick and fast. So Andy McEntee, as he has done, as we can see with the goalkeeping position, he's not afraid to try players. So, But is that part of the issue, column? Is there, is there too much rotation in the mid team? Well, you'd nearly need to be uh, closer to the thing. But like, if somebody said to me, and I'm managing my club, Simonstown, again this year, uh, and I have been very involved at senior club level for the last... 40 years in Mead. If somebody said to me, uh, can you name three players to put on the Mead team for next Sunday who would make an appreciable difference? I would have to say I couldn't. And I know most of the players in Mead. So I think the players are in there are uh, maybe there's a few not available for various reasons. There's a couple out of the country, but there's no obvious quick fix on this one. Uh, Like there's nobody going to be brought in out of the blue who's going to make an appreciable difference that I can see. Mm. Con- Connor, I think I do remember asking you one day to write, uh, or you suggest one of us suggested any the idea of an article about meadness off the back of the infamous Corkness yeah. uh, report. Um, I think part of the reaction to the mead, mead result is that people want Mead to be strong again. People want Kildare to be strong. They want Leash because they see a, a chink in the Dublin Arbor. And as much as we lambaste the provincial championships and the Leinster one in particular. We we'd love it to be a championship again. So it's it's a shame when we see Dublin perhaps so showing a sign of weakness. And next thing, Meath put in a performance yeah. like that. There's this terrible nostalgia for Meath's glory days, whether it be the late eighties or the the late nineties um, or the early nineties. Even I mean, I, I think I wrote in that article might have been a slightly cruel line that good mead performances can only be seen now on Lake Rogale. You can't catch them anywhere else. They have exclusive rights to mead playing well. Um, what's, ama- what's striking about mead is that they, they seem to have totally stagnated for 10 years. I mean, there's there's columns stat there about them not beating a team higher than them in seven years is very striking. I mean, they did make the Super 8s in 2019, but I think... That was off the back of maybe beating Carlo and Leash and getting to a Leinster final. And then I think they beat Clare by a point in the last 12. So they didn't quit themselves too badly in the Super 8, but at the same time, they were never going to get out of it. 
I yeah. thought last year in the Leinster final, maybe there was a hint of something in the second half. I mean, they lost. They didn't come out of a Dublin game with their morale entirely destroyed, which is a rare event these days. But then that's sort of been put in perspective by Dublin's sort of struggle since. Um, yeah, I was list- not to. I was doing the tracker for the game at the weekend and um, the Division Two and Three games. Not to go into how the sausage gets made too much, but I was <laughs> listening to LMFM for updates, and I, I've never heard such a mournful broad. I believe it was Matty Kerrigan does those games. Matty Kerrigan, is yeah, it? Matty Kerrigan. I've never heard such a mournful bonds. broadcast um, as as that one. And uh, when Mead <laughs> finally did score, yeah, um, I was watching it. Yeah. It was. A, <laughs> I don't know when Galway will live to regret this. There was an incredible ironic cheer. Yeah, we mentioned that on Monday. It was our favourite ever ironic cheer. And I'd say it won't be forgotten by any Amid man for a long time, well, Colin. That's be, sarcastic. It might be applause. akin to Nicky English's smile in that Munster final all those years ago. I yeah. don't know if Mead Well, the worst, thing, that, the worst thing you can have in football is somebody to have sympathy for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a time when Mead experienced plenty of hatred. Yeah. and I was That was swapped. way better. Well, I, I'd swap hatred for sympathy any and uh, you know when you look at me in a historical sense I think you have to go back to the 1920s uh, and to to have such a long period like we're two decades out of it and like in 30 in the 30s we got to an All-Ireland final 40s 50s 60s and then 80s 90s so it's the longest period nearly in 100 years since me working involved in something, which, you know, is very demoralising. There's no young fellas here in St. Pat's who, who have ever seen me winning anything or playing well or putting it up to any big team. You know, and you need that sort of thing to inspire young generations. Now, we had the minors over the last couple of years, few years doing very well, but nothing beats a good senior team to give a boost to young fellas. Absolutely. Um, just a quick word, Roy, then D- Division Two, we, we, we've been discussing the last couple of podcasts. It's it's very interesting. It's very tough. And, you know, Cork, after a chastening first week now, a very tricky game. They're playing in the home of Ed Sheeran. Uh, they're, so they're playing against Clare. Um, you know, that's that 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 really you now that's the litmus test for this Cork team, isn't it? That That's a team. They'd be perceived during the summer, they would be perceived to be beating. But when it comes to the league, it's it's not really, I don't know. It, the, you could almost say the balance of powers, it could be swinging there. It could be. I would, I'd probably make Claire slight favourites going into that on Saturday night. I mean, the county board, I don't know, was it, as, was it wise to put the hurling on first? Um, at least if you put the football on for, first, you might get, you know, people coming in for the second half of the football and give them a small bit of a G up, but you could be looking at a situation where you might have 10, 11, 12, 13,000 in Parky Cueve. The hurling finishes and they all get up off their seats and leave, which is, again, a very dispiriting thing for, for the footballers to have to deal with. And I'm sure it'd be a bit of a boost for Claire. Um, I think that's a really, really tough assignment. Dave, there's three, Claire have three forwards that I think would walk onto the Cork team. I'm not too sure if there's any Cork forward that would walk onto the walk onto the Clare team. I'd see that game absolutely fraught. And if Cork lose that, and then they're heading up to Derry the following weekend, you know they're 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 going to be right. They're going to be seriously looking at the trap door at that stage. And to go back to your earlier point, Connor, the uh, the archive library isn't the exclusive preserve of a uh, farmer. You know, it's, me aren't the only one that have the uh, the. the the mon- the monopoly over uh, archive archive library performances so yeah i think it's pro- it's it'll be worrying enough from a cork perspective Colin, it is division two is 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 always it's always very interesting um i i think we've kind of we've seen that you know Derry and galway kind of put their hands up um last weekend uh, it's obviously it's obviously very very early doors but um there's there is a lot of there's a lot of potential in that young Derry side isn't there yeah, there's no doubt about that, and, and they have made uh, improvements. Like it's not so long ago since Derry were in the fourth division, so then mm. they have made improvements, and their performance against Donegal hinted at something better. And they also, with Rory Gallagher, who who seemed to be the sort of architect of defensive play, it seems as if uh, he has changed tack a little bit with Derry, and they're a much more offensive team. One of the biggest additions, of course, is Connor Glass coming home from Australia. Connor Glass is a superb footballer, 
who would be a, a star on any team. And he has a wonderful attitude as well to football. He'd be completely committed and disciplined and his work rate is exceptional. He's what he he is a star, and of course they have Shane McGuigan and Karen McGuckey, and they have they have lots of very good individual players. In Derry, the problems in the past was club football dominated mm. to, uh, I think, to the detriment of uh, county football, and it took somebody like Eamon Coleman, who had the charisma, to draw all these fellas together. But it seems now as if they're putting their best foot forward with with the county team, and of course. The benefit of that uh, is the is the split season because they can give exclusive uh, sort of uh, rights to the county side early in the year. So for, w- one of the big advantages of the split season, I would say, is Derry a common team. And if you back two years before COVID, Galway made a massive start under Corey Joyce, and then COVID came and the whole thing seemed to fall apart. So it's a big year for him. If uh, things don't go well for Corey Joyce this year. You know, he's on his third year. He probably will be looking at the trap door as well as a lot of other teams. Like football has gone like soccer insofar as you get a few years. And if you're not doing the business, then you're out. And Galway have plenty of players. There's no doubt about that. And like individually, they would have had better players than Mead. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're away to Offaly now. So you, you, you fear for Offaly in, in that one in, in terms of it's been a bit of a baptism of fire in Division 2. Um, we we will we'll, we'll move on to Division Three now briefly. Um, uh, Rory Leash versus West Mead yeah. has the look of a, a, a an early season title decider there, a four pointer. I I watched um, Leash and Loath. We had it on the show last Sunday night, and um, again, like a lot of games last weekend, Colm and I were speaking of this spoiled by the weather. It was just a, like. It's like they're redeveloping their grounds above and loads. So this game was played in, R- in RD. It's club ground. Um, pitch, you know, not, you will say, not necessarily at a county standard, but look, that we would be used to. I don't want to upset the groundsman up there. <laughs> and um, You just have. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. And it's a lovely pitch, by the way. It's a lovely pitch. It's a lovely pitch. But uh, the... Loud actually started that game quite well. They had three really good goal chances early on. Uh, Leash keeper made two excellent saves and then they just fluffed their last one, which could have made it slightly different. Then Leash went up the other end of the field and got a breakaway goal. One thing I did notice, and this is becoming a big feature, but I was impressed with Leash overall. They're in good physical shape and and, and they're um I think they I think I, I would make having watched him, I think Billy has him in has him in a, has him in a good place, and I think they will come out of that division. But one thing I did notice, and I've seen this now quite a lot, there's a remar- and and again, Leash scored a goal from this. There's a remarkable number of goals now being scored with goalkeepers with the short kick out that's not 100 percent and allowing the forward to come in and just get a hand in or a little tip or a little strip, and all of a sudden you're you know, you have two lads in with a simple one-two and a kick into the empty net. Like, it, ha- it must have happened, because I watched a, a heap of matches over the weekend. I'd, I'd say it must have happened at least four or five times. And they're only in the games that we see. So it's a big feature now, like this, this short kick out. So all the teams are pushing up on it. And I think if you take that little bit of a risk, I think there's definitely. It wasn't a weekend was. for a short kick out, really. Yeah, was it? well, and especially into the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but no, I was impressed with Leash, and I think, like, at the same time, you know, Westmead probably didn't deserve to be relegated out of Division Two last year. So I think that's going to be a really interesting contest this weekend. Yeah. Connor, on the podcast on Monday, Mick Foley said, nothing will uh, test your enthusiasm for a league match quite like a league match. He was speaking after a fairly weather-impacted week uh, schedule, but I don't think there's a Gaelic football fan in the country who isn't salivating at the thought of Tralee on Saturday night now. there's yeah. a sa- it's, it's sold out since a sold Monday out. afternoon. Um, yeah, that's happy. 12, 12 or 13,000 people. Um under lights in Tralee, it's become a bit of a tradition now in the last couple of the last few years yeah. uh, for Dublin and Kerry. It tends to be a little bit spiky, tends to be a little bit bad tempered and usually very close game. And now we have t- two giants of Gaelic football who in week two of the season desperately need a win. <laughs> they both have question marks over them. Yeah, the fixture has been fantastic. Um, 
the last three, I believe, Kerry won in 15 and 19, quite narrowly. They won by a point in 19, an excellent game. And then the middle game was a draw um, in 2017. I'm not sure which was the game which ended in the full-scale brawl, which Jim Gavin stepped around. That might have been the most recent 19. one. But yeah, um, it should be, a, should be a good game. And what was, I mean, I would suspect from this remove that Kerry should win it. Um, if only because you know the nature of Dublin's performance of the weekend and also the way Desi Farrell spoke after it like he did make sort of concerted efforts to play it down he talked about being competitive you know he wasn't talking about a sort of full-scale backlash to that defeat and mm. he did acknowledge that you know the team might change but it will still be an inexperienced team and he, he made no bones about that so in that sense I would say um, you know Kerry possibly they were the ones who were pro- uh, who you know they were the ones who they'd be expected to win this game in the normal run of events i would say anyway slightly and now that dublin are in such uh, sort of uncertain phase Kerry, you know last the weekend was a bit of a jolt for them i, I presume they would have thought they'd win that game uh, they have issues at midfield a few players out but you know you'd imagine back in tralee um they get a better performance than they managed against Newbridge in a sort of than the performance in Newbridge, which was a particular circumstances attended to that game. Very tight pitch, Kildare very up for it. Jack O'Connor going back. You know, you, you'd imagine Kerry. There's more of a spark of potential in Kerry at the moment to back to have a backlash to their original performance, and I would expect Kerry to win that game. Colin, it's striking to hear Desi Farrell. I won't go so far as to say making excuses, but like highlighting the players who are who are out now jim gavin didn't have to deal with as many defeats shall we say but it wouldn't have been a very jim gavin statement to make to to highlight the players who are out his his um his motto would have very much been like you know if you're good enough to play for dublin you're good enough to play for dublin so if you have that jersey on you're expected to win you're expected to perform that wasn't quite the reaction from desi which i think might might have perturbed a good few dublin fans yeah, well, sure, we can write Dublin off completely at this stage. After <laughs> They're this done. They're toast. Complete disarray. They have no <laughs> chance in the league. They'll probably be relegated and uh, will be out early in the Leinster Championship. So, I, again, you know, after one match, but Desi Farrell is a different personality than Jim Gavin. Uh, Jim Gavin would have, he never had to deal with this, so we don't mm. know, but like he would have sort of put on a sort of a match face, came out and said, you know, that's it. We'll We'll move on. And there'll be no excuses. I don't see, I think Connor is right. I don't see any short term fix for Dublin. And uh, uh, this looks like a game for Kerry, especially if they get the Nagel lads back, dear Mother Connor, Jack Savage. I think uh, Stephen O'Cumper was badly injured the last day, so he may not be playing. Yeah, not confirmed, but it seemed to be a dislocated shoulder last I heard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's great, and the atmosphere in Tralee is fine. But I make the point always. If the league was being played at the right time of the year, which should be March, April, May as a forerunner to the championship, it's not just Tralee that would be needed to hold it. Like Killarney would be a full house if you had Dublin going down there maybe on a May Bank holiday weekend uh, like that. So like the GEA are, you know, it's fantastic, the atmosphere, but they're selling themselves short in terms of marketing of big games. Now it's going to change next year, but the league still starts as the first competition when it should be at a better time of the year, when you had a better football, like last weekend was a dreadful weekend for football. Unfortunate that it was nearly the worst day of January and other Sundays were brilliant for football. But at this time of the year, you're going to get bad quality pitches. You're going to get messy games as a result. If two Northern teams are playing, and I have to always, I couldn't let uh, uh, a podcast go without putting the boot into the Ulster teams. <laughs> Two <laughs> of them playing like uh, mm. uh, Monaghan and Tyrone, like games are almost unrefereable when you have the teams who are short passing. And the same with Donegal and Mayo last Sunday. I felt sorry for the referees trying to enforce the rules in those games with the amount of short passing and the amount of contact times with the ball. Is it a free to one or the other? So uh, the wider point is. is Pity the games out and later in the year when there'd be a greater spectacle. Yeah. Um, and that brings us on to my next point, actually, Roy, is that the truncated nature of the season means that when Mayo fans see the likes of Tommy Conroy go down in an NUIG Sigerson game, you know, their hearts are in their mouths. We don't know. It's a knee injury. 
no you know we don't know what it is yet it could be a strain it could be a it could be a rupture you know we no, we don't want to really speculate but a knee injury when you're dealing with a with a season that's about five months long yeah can't be good no uh we mentioned it the other day as well in relation to Garrett McKinless from Derry in relation to Carmen Costello potentially we don't really know how bad that injury could potentially be. You, we've seen it with now with Stefan Akambor, who probably needs as much game time and a clear run of things just to try and reacclimatize to Gaelic football more than anybody else. But because of the nature of the season, let's say you're gone for two months or ten weeks or three months, that's your season pretty much gone because you're not going to be able to do a huge amount while you're um, rehabbing the injury or recovering from it. These guys are amateurs ultimately, so they're probably going to work while dealing with the injury at the same time. A lot of them, obviously, the lads that are students wouldn't be. But And then so by the time you, you do get it to a situation whereby the injury is recovered from, you've then, tried to got, you've then got to get yourself fit to play at that level, which could take anything up to four to six weeks to try and get yourself back to match fitness by which time the season could be over. You could be out of the championship. So I think that's a big part of it. And I think that's why it'll ultimately favour the teams with the deeper panels and the deeper pick. And that's why I do give Mayo a good shout right across it, because I do think they have a deeper panel than most. One interesting point to go back to Cullum's one, which I thought was really curious as well, um, given the nature of the um, internecine feuding that tends to happen within Ulster. Uh, David Goff has been appointed to referee Armagh Tyrone, and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> it was, what would you say, a wise choice by, uh, yeah. by, by officialdom to send the best referee up to that one, you know. And the uh-huh. point you're making, Rory, is absolutely accurate about the depth of panels. Wait till next year when you have this convoluted type season and it could take 17 or 18 games to win the All-Ireland. So if you have all of that from January to July, can you imagine the amount of injuries that's going yeah. to be in that time yeah. span? And uh, at the end of it all, players will be absolutely whack going back to their clubs. They'd need yeah. to be able to send them off on a holiday for two weeks to let them recover. So yeah. like, there's going to be massive demands on amateur players next year because the intensity of games is going to come week after week after week from January on to June. Yeah, and well, at least the one thing there, Colm, is it seems the the inter county championships are going to finish in late July, but most counties have already indicated that they're not going to start their championships until September. So there probably will be a chance yeah. for those inter county players to, to rest up before yeah. they have well, club action. Yeah, that's right. In Mead, for this year, actually, uh, we play away without our, our, our county players. We have two at the under 20s and two at the seniors, but I don't mind. The season starts next weekend. And we'll have 10 or 11 games without county players. So, you know, I'm not worried about that at all. We'll just play away and they'll come back and the championship has been set to start around the middle of August. Yeah. Um, Connor, just a couple of last points then. Uh, the, the curiosity of the red card in injury time, um, it seems that uh, Rory and the gang on TV may have solved it. They, uh, they discussed it on, on League Sunday on, on Sunday night and lo and behold, um, in Tuesday's Irish Independent, Colin Keyes had a story saying that the uh, the, um, the the committee on, on playing rules are having a look at that. And it may, at Congress, come about that if you get sent off in normal time, you are not going to be able to return for extra time. Because this is an issue, because extra time is now going to be far more prevalent because replays have been all but done away with in the inter-county game. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to see the Sunday game yet again leading the rules committee by the nose. I mean, Rory has immense power there. I, I <laughs> and he uses it wisely. Uh, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a silly rule, though, in fairness. It was a decade ago, you were accused of highlighting people and getting them suspended, wasn't it? I don't <laughs> to see the CSI Sunday game, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was always a curious anomaly in the rules. Um yeah, um, we saw what happened with Kilku, um Aiden Brannigan with a free to win the game, steps up and does that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what entered his head. I presume he got annoyed by some sort of play acting behind the kicker. I mean, he didn't need to involve himself in it. He fell for it anyway. Um, uh, yeah, it was always a curious, curious rule that a player who's red carded, you're allowed to bring on a sub, but black carded, you're not. Wasn't that correct? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's 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 obviously something they've overlooked. It looks absurd. I presume they'll iron out that. And, you know, as you say, with extra time, with replays becoming sort of being made less of a feature of the 
championship yeah. summer. Connor, that, that, summer. that's there for all time. I remember McLean's being sent off in Dublin games and we struggled on to the end of the game and got back then to 15 for the extra time and got a draw. So like, yeah. it's it's come back that long. But I think it'll be interesting to see will Kilku argue now because Aidan Brannigan would be entitled to a one-match suspension uh, on the foot of getting a straight red. I presume Kilku will argue the one-match suspension was uh, served during the extra time because it is denoted as a, a new game uh, for for match purposes. So I presume they will argue now it's a new game. He served as one match ban, so he's back for the All Ireland final. I would expect that there's going to be fireworks over that one, and it could uh, uh, that's one that could uh, end up with the DRA. Yeah, so they'll obviously have to close yeah. that loophole if they if they change the the relationship of a red card to extra time. They'll also have to well, they, they, they'll have the to look at whether extra time is considered card, an extra game. The black card has highlighted the anomaly. I mean, if yeah. the rule is around forever, I mean, and obviously you can't have a situation. The black card is primarily in because of cynical fouls late in games, so it need the penalty needs to carry over to extra time to have any force in that respect. So. They'll have to change the red card rule, I'd imagine. No, but I know it's a, a new game. So, I mean, you don't start, you don't start nil nil at extra time, you know. Yeah. So it's just, it was just the whole thing. But you could it's actually embarrassing in a way. Like. Yeah, you could in extra time too. You could start a new team. You know, that's yeah. the other thing about it. The team that finishes it in normal time. Say you get to extra time, and I have taking advantage of it myself, you could put on three or four fresh players at the start of extra time and still have three subs as well. So, like, from that point of view, uh, that sort of anomaly you would want to be cut out as well is that you can't start a completely different team. Mm. Yeah, well, look, it, it does look like... It's been highlighted before, but I think the Kilku instance, just the immediacy of the red card and the return, I, th- I think, and the fact and that it was on they, TV. They, yeah, and they have Congress there uh, the 26th of uh, mm. February. It's in, uh, what, three weeks' time. Just yeah. get it onto the claw, get it sorted out and get it done. Rory, I have one last question for you. I was just wondering, have you got tickets for Ed Sheeran down in the park? <laughs> I know, I know. That's... Do you know what, though? I was, I, was, uh, I was talking to a couple of my buddies last night about it. I think the... Um, what the hurt? I don't know if it's as big a deal. I mean, look, the stadium has to be repaid for it. This is the reality of it all. This is what happens when you, I suppose, um, when you squander money, down. Rory. That's what. Well, you're yeah, trying. yeah. And look, building the Taj Mahal. Croke, Croke Park was in a similar situation with American football in the past, and different things happened down through the years. This is what happens. Obviously, you, the, this was also a concerts that were booked in almost pre-COVID, uh, before the change to the season, before the squashing of everything in, probably wasn't expected to overlap with championship to be happening in them and at that time. So they've been caught out. But is it a big deal? I would argue not really. Let the hurlers are going to go to Thurles. Show me a car curling team that doesn't enjoy going up there or a supporter. Um, and, and the footballers are going to get enough. Squishing the footballers in the parking ring now, that's it. But, but I think that's actually a fantastic thing. I mean, I think, like, you have to remember, parking ring is technically the home. Ve- it's where they train. It's where all club championship matches are played. It's a proper home venue for Cork football. And I think that's a far better venue to take on. Now, the pitch is the same size, all that crack, but it's a little bit tighter in terms of the atmosphere. It'll be full. You'll have a reasonably good car crowd there. It'll be quite vocal. And it's the place that the footballers will be more familiar with as opposed to Parky Cueve, which sometimes when you play Kerry, it almost feels like they're the home team. So I'm, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And like it can hold 14, 15,000, which is all you will probably get at that game anyway. So I'm not so sure if it's as big a deal as there were being, as it was being made out yesterday. It's interesting they're insisting upon Porky Rin this time because a few years ago they when Porky Cueve was being rebuilt, they were happy to play successive years in Fitzgerald Stadium. I mean, I don't know if last year probably puts them off going back to Fitzgerald Stadium <laughs> any earlier than they need to, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, but it's all, also Ed Sheeran is playing havoc. He's played havoc with the championship for a few years now. I, I seem to recall was was Salt Hill, the Salt Hill pitch in a terrible state for a hurling Leinster game a few years ago. Pure Galway Wexford, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's it's that him as well, was it? Yeah, He's yeah, a scourge. Yeah. This man is worse than the beast from the east in terms of. <laughs> anyway, it'll be lovely to see Parky Quee full. <laughs> uh, Parky Ring. <laughs> was it was it ever full for any GEA game? I, I presume. I don't not. think it's been full yet, has it, Rory Park Cueve? 
Mm, no. This, not this, well, no, no. I think they, they would have had... Cork played Tipperary. I think there was maybe 30... Was there close? Was there 35 or 36,000 down there for Cork tip? Uh, in the first round, one of the round robins, and then you would have had an All Ireland quarter final between Tipperary and Clare, which I think got mid 30s as well. But no, it has never been full, full. No. no. Yeah, I think the biggest crowd there was for Liam, Liam Miller, Miller tribute match yeah. thus far. That's yeah. the biggest crowd in it, which should probably be surpassed by Ed Sheeran, I guess. So maybe I one day. Look, I mean, like, the, the reality is this, that that's like that stadium should never have been built in the first place, but. But, but that's a bit milk. late for that, that now. That's, 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 spilt, that's spilt milk at this point. Oh, it is, it is, yeah. A lot of milk spilt. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll leave, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much to Colin and to Connor and to Rory. Uh, quick public service announcement. As always, we'll have um, Saturday and Sunday sport and all our online coverage. And um, the the Dublin, the Kerry Dublin match in Tralee will be live on RTE2. Live on RTE. League Sunday on um, Sunday evening on RTE2 will feature the lovely Colm O'Rourke. And as a hurling analyst, it will feature the return of Davy Fitzgerald to your screen. So there's something for everybody to look forward to. Mm. Um, It'll be lively. <laughs> Colm laughing. <laughs> you should get him on for the football too, Colm. <laughs> <laughs> A man should only have to take so much punishment in life. <laughs> <laughs> well, your punishment now for this after this morning is over, Colm. Thank you to yourself and to Rory and to Connor, and we'll catch you all again next week. Bye bye. Cheers, guys. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! Wow. It's over the bar!